that. So James the Fourth was born on March seventeenth of fourteen seventy three to James the Third of Scotland and Margaret of Denmark. He was born at Stirling Castle. He became Duke of Rothsey at birth because he was the heir apparent. He had two younger brothers, one also named James, Duke of Ross, and then John of Earl of Mar. I just went in with the Skin Nova by Vive after I put on my moisturizer. The three boys were probably raised in infancy at Sterling Castle, uh, as well as their youths with their mother. In 1478, Margaret was given the rights to custody and education of little James. Not a lot is known about his younger life, but it is known he was given a good education from Archibald Whitelaw and John Ireland under Margaret's direction. I might zoom you in a little bit here. Just... Whitelaw was a human was a humanist scholar and secretary of state and Ireland was a theologian. While he while James was fluent in Scots Oh, there was like nothing on that. There we go. Oh, much better. He also became fluent in Spanish. He also learned French, German, Flemish and Italian. James was the last Scottish monarch known to have spoken Gaelic. Records show that the prince was taken from Stirling to visit Edinburgh Castle in the summers of 1474 and 1479. So because the War of the Roses was currently happening in England, James III agreed to a peace treaty with James, uh, with Edward IV of England. I'm just going through with the Vive Concealer and covering all my spots. The base of the treaty was a marriage between Prince James and Cecily of York. This was the beginning of King's James King of King. James's pursuit of a friendship with England. <clears throat> that wasn't popular with Scotland, as was King James III's reign. He had faced two rebellions and alienated members of his close family, specifically his younger brother, Alexander, Duke of Albany. So I already put the um, paint pot by MAC and painterly on my eyes. I'm going to be using the Makeup by Mario Ethereal Eyes palette, which was gifted to me by one of my clients, and I greatly appreciate it. So I've been kind of using this the past, oh, like we all know how satisfying this is, right? Um, I've been using this for the past few days just to kind of like get a feel for it and different things I can do. So I really, um, I really like it. I wish it was a little bit more pigmented, but it is nice. It's buttery, blendable, and, um, I do like that we have, there's shimmers in here and there's like a, this one was nice. I'm, I'm going to use this today. I liked this one a lot and how I did my makeup yesterday. So um, there's four almost metallic, but they're really good. You know how like some, that's nice. Some, oh, that one's really nice actually. I like that a lot. Some metallics 
are when you use them they fall out it's not solid i feel like this is a salt these are solid so i'm getting back to it i'm gonna go in with that lightest shade for my brow bone color his so james the third's pro english policy bit him in the ass when the piece with when the peace with england broke in 1480 scotland was invaded by england and berwick was captured in 1482 by richard the then duke of gloucester and in the company of the Duke of Albany, the king's younger brother. James led his army against this invasion and his army his army rebelled against him and he was imprisoned briefly by his own counselors. So I'm just going to go through with this transition shade. I'm going to pull out a little bit here. During this time, Albany went to see Queen Margaret and Prince James at Stirling Castle to talk about the crisis with them. This rocked Prince James's world and gone was the calm of his youth at only nine years old, which he still he was still a little baby at that time. I feel like he's really little. Queen Margaret died in July of 1486 King James was favoring his second son, and Prince James was apprehensive. The king had given his second son, James, the dukedom of Ross, and was trying to marry him with one of Edward IV's daughters between 1486 and 1487. At that time in history, well, at that time, Edward IV had already died. Henry VII was king. His, Edward IV's oldest daughter was married to Henry. Elizabeth of York was married to Henry VII. So I'm, I'm wondering why he was doing this. But they had already gone through Titulus Regius and it had been um, nixed. So... The girls were in good standing. Uh, I think it's really to give a little bit of clout to, or get, you know, James married off to somebody who was, had, um, title. So no one knows why James the Fourth favored his second son. Now that I went on the other tangent, uh, tangent. But it's being suggested that the king didn't trust his heir due to the meeting that Duke of Albany had had with him in 1482. I find odd James, little James, was only nine. And what choice did he have? I mean, he probably didn't even understand what he was, what was really going on. I mean, if you have a nine-year-old or I've had a nine-year-old, I mean, are they really going to? comprehend what they're being told is my question no is the answer so on february 2nd of 1488 prince james left sterling castle without his far father knowing and this started another rebellion against james the third just going in underneath There we go. So I really, my eyes look really blue with this. These are really warm. There's one cool, uh, there's two cool toned browns in this, but everything else is really warm. Um, which I, I, I like. I am digging this. The trash trucks are outside, so if you hear that, my apologies. So I'm just going through with that brown and just kind of blending that out. So this rebellion was led by the Earl of Angus and the Earl of Argyle, as well as 
the home and Hepburn families. Prince James had become the figurehead for this rebellion and for the rebels. And he had surrounded himself with Anglophile counselors. The rebels had claimed they removed the prince from Sterling to protect him from his father. June 11th of 1488, tensions came to a head when the royal and rebellion and the rebellion armies fought outside of Sterling. The king's army was defeated and he was killed during battle. The now King James IV had held guilt for the role he played in his father's death. A day after the battle, the new king issued his first charter. Both Edinburgh and Stirling castles were secured as well as the late king's money and jewels. I'm just going to go in with that really that darkest shade in this. And I'm just going on the outside corners just to deepen that crease area. This is real. These are really buildable too, which I, I like. So I'm just going through and kind of stretching that area out a little bit. There we go. So I'm just going to go back in with my last brush that had that warmer brown and just kind of buff that area. So the leaders of the rebellion were rewarded with offices of state and posts in the royal household. James' coronation was held on June 24th, 1488 at Scone, Scone. I've heard it called Scone. I'm saying Scone, Scone Abbey. A few days later, he was present at his father's burial at Cambus Kenneth, Cambus Kenneth. Abby, I'm pretty sure I, I'm pretty sure that's how you pronounce it. James had proved to be an effective king, uh, defeating a major rebellion in 1489 and laying siege to Crosstown, Ducal, and Dumbarton castles, then defeating a rebel army at Gartloning in Stirlingshire. So because I've gotten that depth go back in with this and just buff that line out up here I'm just gonna buff in here there we go now I'm gonna take that color right here there don't they these don't have names they're just numbered so that would be e e8 this is like a really pretty shimmery brown so i'm just gonna do the center where the light hits to almost highlight it i might put that really pretty gold over it just like a touch of it i'm swiping with my finger and i'm gonna use my finger for these just so i don't get a lot of fallout with that um with the glitters because sometimes those can, those can be Difficult. Yeah, I'm gonna go in with that. That would be so just a just a tad. There we go. That's what I wanted. Just a little bit. Don't mind my hands, my spray tan is wearing off. Now I feel like we need a little bit on the inner corners. A little depth in the inner corners. So Take this teeny little brush that I have, which is really good. I don't even know what this is. I'm going to take that darker color. <clears throat> I'm going to go in there and just deepen that corner. I don't know if you can see that. I'm trying. Not a halo eye, but close. Yeah, see, it needed that. See the difference? That pops that right out, that middle bit. So getting back to it, uh, he also took an interest in justice. 
He ended a feud between the Murrays and the Drummonds. Scottish Parliament granted a £5,000 tax to fund an embassy, an embassy in France and Spain to search for a wife for the king. The Pope granted James the Golden Rose. No, not from The Bachelor. Okay. In 1491. And the alliance with France was renewed in 1492. Treaties were made with Denmark and Spain. Again, going in with that really dark color in this palette. Seven, what's the number? E E twelve. So I'm just going in with that on that lower bit. Better. Perfect. Okay. Treaties were made with, Den like I said, treaties were made with Denmark and Spain. Now, because James, James's mom was from Denmark, he had relatives in Denmark. Uh, so I think that was an easy call uh, to go to them. And then a truce was negotiated with Henry VII of England in 1493 through 1494. But James met with Hugh Roe O'Donnell, king of Ty Turconnell, in June of 1485 in Glasgow. O'Donnell was a powerful Northern Irish magnate, 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 and an enemy of Henry's government in Ireland. So James and Hugh made a defensive alliance. And also discussed a boy named Perkin Warbeck. Perkin claimed to be Richard, son of Edward IV and Elizabeth Woodville, and a claimant to the English throne. Hugh had been a supporter of his for years. Okay, I just jumped up to do my liner. Perkin arrived in Scotland in 1495 and brought the attraction of Maximilian, king of the Romans, Ferdinand and Is Isabella of Spain, Philip, Duke of Burgundy, and Margaret of York. Perkins could be aunt. We're not sure. She was sister to Edward IV. James knew backing Perkins' cause could give him leverage while trying to make European alliances, but at the same time, it would make a really great alliance with Henry if James threatened him with Perkin. James invaded England in September of 1496 with Perkin at his side. They destroyed numerous towers and two castles. They retreated on September 25th when support they thought would come failed to happen. James now needed to rid himself of Perkin, so he put him on a ship and Perkin, Perkin went to Ireland. James invaded England once more and laid siege to Norham Castle. Because how James... Because of how forceful James was with his rule into Northern England, Henry came to know how vulnerable the English and Scottish border was. So he sought for a treaty. So he sought for a treaty with Scotland, with James. The Treaty of Dayton was signed on September 30th of 1497. With this treaty was an agreement to a seven-year truce between the two countries. The idea raised to strengthen the peace between the two. The idea was raised to strengthen the peace between the two countries that a marriage between James and Henry's oldest daughter, Margaret, would take place. After about five years of the Dayton Treaty being held, I'm just going through, doing my concealer. 
Scottish and English commissioners met at Richmond Palace on January 20. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, this comes out Tuesday, so this would have been last Wednesday. Um, right, met at Richmond Palace on January 24th of 1502. A marriage was agreed between James and Margaret Tudor at the time, which included a dowry of 35,000 pounds. That is a lot of money now, probably close, I would guess close to a million, I, I would assume. That's a lot of money. And a treaty between the two countries was also part of the dowry. Under the terms of the new agreement, the Treaty of Perpetual Peace, there had to be a good, a good, real, and sincere, true, sound, and firm peace. Friendship, league, confederation to last all time coming. That's all quote. That was, that was rough. Neither king or their successor were to go to war against the other. Well, that didn't play out really well now, did We're going to find that out. If one broke the treaty, they would be excommunicated by the Pope. The treaty was confirmed at the altar of Glasgow Cathedral. I've been there. I'm going to insert a picture right here. On December 10th, 1502, during a ceremony that both kings attended. This was the first peace treaty between the two countries since 1328. The marriage took place by proxy on January 25th of 1503 at Richmond Palace. So if you follow me on Instagram, I always do it on this day. I really dropped the ball on that one. And I meant to put that in there. So I'll add it today. So follow me on Instagram. Uh, a, at make a same name. At Makeups and Monarch. At Makeup and Monarchies. This was... January 25th was a big day for weddings. It was... Edward II and Isabella of France were married on the on that day King Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn were married on that day and now James and Margaret were married on that day interesting if anybody's into astrology I should probably look up that January 25th I wonder if it's like a day of love or something do we miss the mark on Valentine's Day so King Henry and Eliz Queen Elizabeth were present with their 13 year old daughter margaret and the earl of bothwell stood in as proxy for james margaret left for scotland on june 27th and was received by the archbishop of glasgow and the earl of moray at lamberton on august 8th the wedding was celebrated at holyrood abbey so at this time, we know Margaret's 13, which little, she's a little kid. Uh, and James is 30. But I, from what I've read and like researched and they had a pretty good marriage and between like even the huge 17 year age gap, uh, they were, I mean, I get, he really did love her. What more can you ask for, right? Their first child was born on fifth, uh, wasn't born until 1507 when she was 17. Their son James was made Duke of Rothsey at Holyrood House in February of 1507. The baby died a year later and Margaret was already pregnant with their second child at that point. So that baby was born July born and died in July of 1507. Their third child would be named Arthur and he was born in 1509 after his now late uncle. He only lived to be, well, okay, I'm gonna play devil's advocate for a minute. So some accounts say that the baby was born at or the baby was named Arthur after the uncle, which was Prince Arthur, Prince of Wales. 
Margaret's older brother. Some reports say that that's not the case, that he was born or he was named after King Arthur, the mythical could be, could have been a uh, person, king. So it's hard to say. I mean, I think probably, I think, I think Arthur, Prince of Wales was named after the myth, after the myth of King, King Arthur. And I think this was probably both. So this baby Arthur only lived to be 10 months. On April 10th of 1512, they welcomed another boy named James who would live to become James V. Their next child, another unnamed daughter, also died shortly after birth in November of 1512. A year and a half later, they had another boy born April 30th of 1514. His name was Alexander and was given the title Duke of Ross. He died on December 8th of 1515 I'm sorry December 18th of 1515 at 19 months old also okay so I'm gonna not tangent but I'm gonna do a little side note I feel like something was up with their genetics when I say there I mean Henry the eighth and Margaret because they had, there were a lot of babies born that did not make it. And I know that's probably um, common then because of medicine and whatnot. But I don't know. I wonder if something was up with their genetics. Because their grandmother, Elizabeth Woodville, had a ton of kids. And so did her mother. And... Their mother, Elizabeth of York, had, she had seven, I think, total for lived. So I don't, some, I don't know, was something up? I guess we'll never know. James the Fourth was known as a ladies' man. He had several mistresses and at least five illegitimate children. During his reign, there was a decline in the holding of parliaments, holding only a total of 13 during his time as king. With the end of conflict in England in 1497, the crown didn't need parliament to grant big revenue in the way of taxation. Even in the beginning of his reign, one of his goals was to increase the crown's income. The king had to fund all government expenses out of his own income that came from revenue from crown lands from borough from customs from mail tolls and duties so borough customs were monies from the cities and towns and these annual revenues stayed throughout his reign james only got a small amount of income from the borough revenues because most of it went to the nobles and crown servants as rewards. He did succeed in increasing the revenue through different avenues, including the queen's dowry. Henry took a special interest in the Royal Scots Navy and expanded it, putting it up, putting up new fortresses at Largo and in Garvey, in, in Garvey, I'll put the spelling of that there, while making extensive repairs at Dunbar Castle. Over the course of his reign, he either commissioned or acquired a total of 36 ships. He also took a huge interest in artillery. He held shooting matches in the great halls of Holyrood Abbey or Holyrood Palace, sorry, and Stirling Castle. I'm not, like, we've, I've been to Stirling Castle, and I, like, that's probably my favorite. That's my favorite one. It's so beautiful, and it's not, like, when you go to, like, Windsor, and you go to, 
Windsor's still a working castle, right? But, like, it's been... Not that it's modernized, because it's not. It's more... It looks like it's out of the 17-1800s. Sterling does not. It looks like it... Like it was back in the 1500s. It's still very old looking and I personally love it. Um, so not a lot of work has been done to it. And I, like, I find that endearing. I love that. He had, James had guns, had guns, shot and powder imported from France and the Royal Gun Foundry was moved to Edinburgh Castle from Stirling Castle. King James was a lover of the arts as well. He patronized music using rental money from the King's Wark. He backed the foundation of King's College in Aberdeen by his Chancellor William Ethelston. Ethelston? Ethelstone? and St. Leonard's College in St. Andrews by his leg illegitimate son, Alexander, Archbishop of St. Andrews, and John Hepburn, Prior of St. Andrews. Oh, I had to, like, spit that one out. In 1496, he passed what was... what has been described... As first educate as the first education act that introduced compulsory compulsory education at grammar schools for the oldest son and heirs of all the barons and freeholders of substance. I'm gonna jump off and do my mascara. The relations between Scotland and England were declining. Henry the seventh was sent had sent Thomas Wolsey to Scotland because he was worried James would renew the old alliance with France. Wolsey wasn't welcomed at all. When Henry the Seventh, or I'm sorry, when Henry the Eighth took the throne in April of 1509, he had no interest in appeasing James. His focus was solely on France. Henry ended up invading France. I'm just going in. Sorry. Side note. I'm just going to go in with Skindu from Vive. Just to brighten the inner corners. There we go. And I, so, I have, oh, I can't tell right now. I have, like, points on my lip, right? So, I like to highlight that a little bit so when I <clears throat> use this so I'm just going in here first hold on please hold I'm just gonna brighten in there a little I love that stuff so I'll take a teeny little brush and I take this honestly you don't need a lot a little bit goes a long way so I will kind of paint on that because if I pull this out to make that look, to highlight that line, it's going to pop that out more. So Henry ended up invading France on June 30th of 1513 and James sent ships to, front, to, to aid the French. Because of the route the ships took, they were so delayed they actually played no part in the war. James then led the Scottish army into England around August 22nd. Norham Castle was taken and partly demolished. Then they moved south again. At this point, I'm going to, I have to blow dry my hair. So I'm going to start doing that. At this point, the army was down... 8,000 men due to illness due to illness and desertion but they still outnumbered the English forces by like 8,000 I'm going in with the design me puff me volume mousse I think okay there we go 
So I take about this much. Again, don't mind my <laughs> my tan. So I just go in at the root, and I always put the product at my fingertips when I do this. So I like rub that through. So you'll see a little bit of leftover in there. So rub at the root. I need a little bit more. I have a lot of hair. Here we go. Just going in again. I really rub in back here because my hair is long and it's very thick. So I like to make sure that this has some vault right in this crown area has some volume to it. ha crown we're talking about king um because i do it does tend to go flat back here because of the weight of the hair so that's that i'm going to blow dry and i'll be right back So I'm done blow drying. Now I'm just gonna go in and curl my hair. And I'm watching the Welsh twins right now while I do this. So here we go. Patrol. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, they cut it up. I'm like, yeah, play nice yeah. thing. Okay, I'm gonna say five pounds. The boys are hanging out. Mmm. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, you got the chunk out of that, didn't you? <laughs> it looks like a bread bowl now. We did a thing. <laughs> oh, mm. Mm. I think it's a bit spongy, like a bit um, wicky. You just think, you think I think this is so warm? <laughs> um. I'm back. Uh, I just curled it. Blow dry curl. Hold on. I'm going to try and find. So I'm just going to go in now while this. Actually, you know what I'm going to do first? I'm going to put on lipstick and then we'll finish out my. That was probably really noisy. This uh, microphone picks up a lot. So I'm going to use, today I'm going to use Charlotte Tilbury Bitch Perfect, which is a nice, like, orangey, peachy nude. I'm not doing a liner. I just want... Oh, the train's in town. I just wanted something really subdued and because this is really dark, I don't want to do too much on my lips. So now I'm going to go in and pull my curls out with the Moroccan oil mending infusion. I don't know why I thought it was fusion, but... So getting back to it, uh, an instruction by the English was that no prisoners were be were to be taken. Explains the mortality of the Scottish army. James was killed in the final stages of this battle. His body was found the next day and was taken to Berwick upon Tweed to be embalmed. There we go. Okay. Not like digging today, but it's fine. Here we go. I'm digging better. I feel like I need a new chair for in here. Because he was excommunicated. So if we're going to we're going to go back a little bit. Remember I said that if one of the if either James or Henry broke the treaty, then they would be excommunicated. So because James invaded England, <laughs> he was excommunicated by the Pope. So because of that, he couldn't be buried in consecrated ground until the Pope remitted the sentence. Even though Henry VIII had gotten the dispensation to have James buried at St. Paul's in London, he still remained unburied. He remained 
that way until the Reformation under Elizabeth I, when the coffin was opened and his body was used as a plaything. Her master, Glazer, is said to have kept his head in a curio at his home before giving it to the sexton at St. Michael's. He was buried at in St. Michael's churchyard. James's son, James, now the James V, was crowned three weeks after his father's death. He was only one at the time, and it caused political upheaval in Scotland. So I already did everything else. This is when we do fun facts. So my fun facts for this episode, I actually have three. Um, he was the last monarch in Great Britain to be killed in battle at Flodden. Introduced, he introduced the print, first printing press in Scotland. And he is, I'm going to say, the daddy of what became the line of monarchs of Great Britain and the United Kingdom. So it actually didn't pass through Henry VIII or Elizabeth I because we know she didn't have any children. Uh, it actually went through Margaret's line. Margaret Tudor, uh, James IV's wife. So that is it for the day or for this episode. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. As usual, all the products I used are listed down below. And I'm trying to think if there's anything else. If you have something you want covered or find out more information on, leave a comment down below. You can follow me over on Instagram at Makeup and Monarchies. Um, I think that's it for today. This was a fun one. Um, Actually, today is Burns Day. Robert Burns was born on this day in 1759, I think. Um, so we had our Burns Night dinner last night because I have to work tonight, but it's fine. Uh, but when this airs, it will be Tuesday. And so that's it for this week. I hope you enjoyed. I will see you in the next one. Having a good one. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.